When you're pregnant between 24 and 28 weeks, you'll be offered the dreaded screening test for gestational diabetes. I'm Annabelle Kearney, and I love helping mamas just like you have a better birth experience. So if you're new to my channel, thank you so much for stopping by, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ding the little bell down below. So what exactly is gestational diabetes? Well, it's a type of diabetes that develops during pregnancy and is temporary. So no, it's not the same diabetes that let's say your dad or grandpa might have. The thing is, during pregnancy, your body goes through some amazing changes and hormones are all over the place as you know and sometimes they mess with how your body handles sugar. And this can lead to gestational diabetes or GD where your blood sugar levels are higher than they should be. Now let's talk physiology real quick because I think it's important to just have a basic understanding of what's going on but I promise I won't get too technical. Okay, so when we eat food, our body breaks down that food into sugar, aka glucose, and starches. And our pancreas usually pumps out a hormone called insulin to help move that glucose from our bloodstream into our cells, where it's then used as energy. But sometimes, the hormones that your placenta makes can make it harder for your body to use that insulin. And without enough insulin, sugar levels can build up in our bloodstream, which is a problem. But the good news is, is that it can be managed with exercise and consuming meals that balance out your blood sugars and medication if absolutely necessary. And it usually goes away after your baby is born. Now, majority of women don't have any symptoms of gestational diabetes because a lot of the symptoms actually are masked by common pregnancy symptoms like feeling really thirsty, needing to go pee all the time, feeling fatigued, and even nauseous. So because a lot of the symptoms can overlap, it's difficult to know for sure without testing. But also, you know your body best, so if you feel like something is off or you experience any of the above mentioned symptoms, then talk to your healthcare provider and see what they can do about that. Okay, so how does testing work? Well, most women get screened for it between 24 and 28 weeks of pregnancy, but if you have a history of diabetes or gestational diabetes with previous pregnancies, you'll likely be offered the test sooner. The test is simply just to see how well your body handles sugar. Also, keep in mind that a screening test is not the same as a diagnostic test. So with a one hour glucose challenge test, you consume 50 grams of sugar, typically given as that syrupy glucola drink. And you drink that within five minutes and after one hour, your blood is drawn and that's it. Typically, you don't need to fast, but some providers do request that you fast to reduce error. Now, the cutoff ranges can vary per institution and lab, but according to ACOG's updated guidelines, you've passed your one-hour test based on the following numbers. If you fasted, a result of less than 95 milligrams per deciliter is a pass, or if you ate before your test, then a result of less than 140 milligrams per deciliter is a pass. Now let's say that you fail the screening test. You just come back to do another test called the three hour glucose tolerance test. And this is where it becomes more time consuming. So you'll be instructed to fast eight to 12 hours before your test. Then you'll have your blood drawn before your test as well. Then you'll drink the same sugary solution, but this time with 100 grams instead of 50 grams of glucose. And then you'll have your blood drawn again three more times, so every 60 minutes after you drink it, hence three hour glucose test. And the reason for multiple blood draws is because your blood sugar levels are supposed to trend down slowly as time passes if insulin is working properly in your body. Now the diagnosis of GD is made when there's at least two abnormal readings from the three hour blood draw. Now personally, I didn't think drinking glucola was all that bad when I took it the first time, but I wasn't a fan of the ingredients and I did notice that it felt like I just ate a bunch of candy and was just sitting there doing nothing. But there are mamas out there who 
don't eat much sugar at all, or are just sensitive to additives, which can make you feel pretty miserable. So just know that drinking glucola is not the only way to test for gestational diabetes. And I wish I knew this my first time. So what you can do is you can drink organic juice, like organic grape juice, um, eat organic dye-free jelly beans, drink dextrose mixed into water, order the fresh test, which is a natural pre-made glucose mix that you just dissolve in water. And I'm sure there's something else that I'm missing, but either way, each method involves consuming 50 grams of sugar, AKA glucose. You can also opt out of the test by doing serial glucose monitoring and check your own blood sugars four times a day with a prick of your finger for two weeks. So remember that you have options, you just need to ask your provider for alternatives if you're interested. Now the big question, how do you pass the test? If you're nervous about not passing, don't be. There is no need to prep for this test weeks in advance because you really can't control what your placenta is doing. But here are four tips to ensure accurate results. If you're allowed to eat before, make sure you avoid all carbs and sugar. Any added sugars could throw off your results and you may end up having to come back to do that three hour test I was talking about. So for that reason, you should stick to eating only protein and some dairy. And that's all you really need to do to make sure you get accurate results. But I know navigating nutrition and food labels can be a little bit tricky. So here are some ideas of foods that you can eat the day of your test. So you can have cheesy eggs with spinach and bacon or sausage, but just make sure you look at the package because some breakfast meats have added sugar. You can also do something super simple like hard boiled eggs with a cheese stick, um, chicken with some type of green, maybe cooked in a little bit of ghee or butter, um, no sugar added beef jerky or protein sticks. And again, if you're eating something from a package, just make sure that you look at the back to see if there's any carbs or added sugars like this. Tip number two, if you can, try to schedule your test for the morning so you don't go all day stressing about what to eat and what not to eat. And if you are fasting, it will make it a lot easier because you can avoid being hangry. Tip number three, stay hydrated. Make sure you drink a glass of water upon waking up and continue to sip on water up until your test because blood is roughly 40% water. So staying hydrated ensures that your veins are nice and hydrated as well. So water plumps up those veins, making it easier for the tech to find them and as a result, makes for a smoother blood draw. And the last tip that I have for you is if you ate, try to go for a light walk before your test. This can help regulate your blood sugar. So what do I want you to take away from all of this? Well, as someone who has experience on the other side as a previous healthcare provider, I am all about medical autonomy. And what that refers to is the concept of individuals making decisions about their own medical treatment without being influenced by their provider. But I do believe that in order to make those decisions, you should have all the pieces to the puzzle to make an informed decision. So ask questions and know your options. So for instance, if you're debating on opting out of the glucose test, you should consider your current health and risk factors for developing GD. And the number one risk factor for gestational diabetes is being overweight, followed by increasing maternal age. You can pause the video and read the other risk factors here and see where you stand with your own individual risk factors. Or let's say you test positive for GD and your provider recommends that you be induced at 39 weeks. The reason for early induction is usually to prevent fetal macrosomia, which is just a fancy way of saying that your baby is too big for your pelvis. But if you take a second to look at the actual criteria for macrosomia, that's a baby that weighs more than 4,500 grams, and some may say more than 4,000 grams. But either way, 4,000 grams is eight pounds, 13 ounces, and 4,500 grams is nine pounds, 15 ounces. And also keep in mind that your bones of your pelvis were made to move. So really your baby can fit through your pelvis. And in reality, less than 10% of babies are actually born big because ultrasounds are not very reliable for estimating fetal weight. 
Also, remember that inductions don't come without risks, and a suspected big baby is not evidence-based practice for an induction. So know that you don't have to agree with everything that they say, and that you have the option to take the time to do more research, or even say no. And I also know that not everyone has the time to research topics, or maybe you just don't know how to go about finding credible sources. And that's why making informed choices is something that I guide you through if you choose to work with me to prep for a natural birth because I think it's just a huge part about taking control of your birth. So if you're interested in preparing for birth, click the link down below and it'll take you to chat with me on Instagram and we can go from there. So hopefully this video was helpful for you to understand the basics of gestational diabetes, your options, tips for testing day, and how you can make informed decisions. Having elevated blood sugars for a prolonged amount of time is not ideal for our babies or our blood vessels, which is why testing for it is important, but it doesn't have to be scary, especially when you are informed. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.